Today we're going to do a little bit on the 21 Taras, but if we, yeah, in the beginning the praises can feel like a lot, um, but kind of as they get familiar, you can kind of really get into a beautiful flow with it and really connect with the Taras that way, but it is something that builds over time. That's actually what I was going to comment on. <laughs> is, uh -huh. um, I've always found with this practice that, you know, when I, when I first enter it, um, you know, after putting Tara at the top of my crown and all of this kind of thing that I, you know, I've sort of got this momentum, right. And then I get into like the third one, I'm like, where am I? And I feel a bit <laughs> lost. It's like, what happened? Where did I go? <laughs> and so I just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, you know, over time it does get smoother. But Look, if all you can think is just green light, green, <laughs> that's something. Yeah. yeah. And it helps to kind of really make friends with one image of the 21 Taras that you particularly like and realize that they go in a sequence. They're not just kind of randomly put on the tanka. Mm -hmm. They go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I'll show you in a second what that looks like. But it's, it's, it's helpful like with the 35 Buddhas, when you're memorizing the 35 Buddhas to get used to the image of the rose and you're like, I'm going blue number one, yeah. blue number two, blue number three, you know, and getting through and, yeah. you yeah, know, it's super helpful. And it, uh, mm -hmm. So the 21 Tara's colors, very roughly, not pervasively, but true enough to say, they go according to peace, increase, power, and wrath. Okay, so uh -huh. you, get, you get some of the 21 Tara's are white colored, some of the 21, color, 21 Taras are yellow colored, some of them are red colored, and some of them are shades of dark blue, black, and gray. So this isn't, um, you know, if we were talking about Tibetan Buddhist iconography in general, don't make these correlations without checking because sometimes the correlation is there and sometimes it isn't. But for the 21 Taras, the ones that are white are generally related to peace and pacifying and soothing and that kind of energy. Yeah, that's really um, to bring a smoothing element to areas of distress, whether inner or outer. The ones that are yellow are related to increase and abundance and uh, wealth and resources and kind of a uh, just feelings of abundance in general. Um, the ones that are yellow in color are to really help us get all of the inner and outer conditions we need in order to practice at our level. So of course the outside resources like a nice house and car and whatever isn't really the main thing, but at our level, if we had really difficult housing situation, it's harder to focus, we're more distracted at our level. So it's wanting the sort of resources externally that will support our forward progress. So then the red ones are related to um, power or magnetizing, red power magnetizing. And this is the sort of like attracting, attracting and magnetizing and having influence that's positive that makes people want to do good things. So the lamas obviously have a lot of magnetizing energy, right? They draw people to them and people are inspired to practice because of them. So the taras that are red in color are related to all those kind of like powerful magnetizing activities. The ones that are scary looking and darker colored, blue blacks, grays, um, super blacks, um, the ones that have weapons, um, although some of the red ones have weapons as well. The, those guys are related to wrath. I should say those gals are related to wrath. And wrath is something that um, at our level, we don't wanna mess with or play with at all because we don't have realized bodhicitta, right? But because the enlightened beings have perfected bodhicitta, they become Buddhas, they can take on a scary aspect to intimidate the negative states of mind of people that are doing the wrong thing. So they're not scaring the people. They're not dominating or oppressing or suppressing the people. They're scaring their negative states of mind. So by adopting a scary aspect, it's a bit like standing up to a bully, but you know that the bully has a good heart. 
if you show an aspect of strength to the bully, their aggression might diffuse and their good heart might come to the forefront, but only if you do it right. And if you don't do it right and you don't do it with bodhicitta, aggression makes for more aggression. And then you get a cycle of violence that never ends and war and all the things. So the way in which you stand up to strong negative behavior, if it's with wrath, it needs to be firmly grounded in bodhicitta. So of course, for the taras that have wrath, no problem. If we don't feel confident in our ability to show a wrathful aspect without having solid bodhicitta, we call on these taras to do it on our behalf and say, please help me with this difficult person in my life who's really harmful or help me with this difficult situation in my life where there's a lot of pain. So sometimes the magnetizing red taras also have this aspect um, with a little bit of wrath, semi-wrath, um, but the blue-black ones especially do. So they're kind of grouped that way. Um, there are some besides Chidamani Tara herself that sometimes have a bit of a greenish, and the greenish is usually to do with wind and swiftness, just like Chidamani Tara herself. So those kind of the, um, the 21 Taras, grouping them and just kind of getting your head around it. For each of them, there is a particular meditation practice you can do. For each of them, there's a particular um, kind of quality to be developed and thing to be purified. And it's said that doing the 21 praises, you know, even just three times a day, can really help purify and protect you on many multiple levels. So you don't have to know all the meditations and all the different aspects of the Taras, just do the praises and it has this really amazing effect. And I'm sure the commentaries go into the numerous effects of doing the 21 Tara praises. But if you're feeling like you need a little extra support in a specific area, you can direct your attention to just one or two of them. So, so this is just a reminder. I think all of you know this, but sometimes you can get a little bit trapped with identity stuff and um, miss that the point of Tantra is to overcome ordinary appearance and grasping. So in this sutra, Tara herself says, in this life, there are no such distinctions as male and female, self-identity, a person, or any perception of such. Therefore, attachment to the idea of male and female is quite worthless. Weak-minded worldlings are continually deluded by this. And then, however, <laughs> the sutra goes on to say, what um, the vow from Tara, there are many who wish to gain enlightenment in a man's form, but there are few who wish to work for the welfare of sentient beings in a female form. Therefore, may I in a female body work for the welfare of beings until samsara has been emptied. So what we're trying to do here is just realize that when we're talking about Tantra at all, it's to reinforce what we understand about emptiness and it's to give us a different, deeper platform for working with bodhicitta. So it's acknowledging that we have identity features, right? We have identities about gender or whatever, but if we can hold them lightly, realizing that they're merely labeled by the mind on very relative worldly things. So they're just kind of labels that rest here lightly. And at the same time, you realize that sentient beings are very locked in their identities. And so if all of the Buddhas you see are in a male aspect, then you think that you can only become enlightened if you're in a male aspect. Or you might think that, um, I don't know, that if you're even just looking at the merit field, for example, if you're looking at the Gelukpa merit field, all of the figures, except for maybe Vajyogini and miscellaneous goddesses are male, right? Why is that? Because if they were women, no one would listen to them, <laughs> right? So from their side, they could have been whatever. They could have been reborn female, they could have been reborn a darker race, a lighter race, a fatter race, a thinner race, or whatever, you know, they could have been reborn in any kind of aspect, but they chose to be reborn as men of that culture and that time because that was the best platform to access the most sentient beings.
right? It was just a really, it was practical to be in that form because of the societies they entered into. So with Tara, we're recognizing that she is not female, but she is also not male because none of the Buddhas are. Right? They adopt these aspects to convey something specific to us. So we can, um, some, I hear some female practitioners get a little bit too hooked on Tara's feminine aspect, you know, and a little bit too identified, like, oh, it's a girl one. It's like, none of them are girl ones, none of them are boy ones. We're talking about overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping. However, sentient beings are locked in gender stuff, so it's good to throw some female aspects aspects into the mix because we're weird they're not yeah are you with me right tantra is trying to crack all these things yeah so you know also if you're a man it's helpful to practice tara and to start breaking down all of this kind of like toxic masculinity stuff that makes life so suffering right and for women it's good to practice male buddhas and kind of crack out of disempowered feelings we might have or lack of strength or weird sort of traps we get into because of how we were socialized but don't think you can't practice the other genders practice because it's a gender thing it's like you're also not green yeah you're also not blue <laughs> you know like why are you fixated on divine genitalia like that's weird yeah you're not weirded out by the green blue <laughs> right that's weirder yeah. So Tantra is overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping in a really radical way. And so know those two sides of what Tara was saying. First of all, gender is nonsense. Second of all, I'm going to adopt a female aspect because there's not so many. Just just because it needed to be said. OK, so it's important to realize there's a source, right? The source of Tara practices are from the Buddha himself and can be found in the Arya Tara Root Tantra and the 108 Names of Tara Sutra. And during the monthly Four Mandala offerings to Chittamani Tara, the praises to the 21 Taras are recited and are related to all classes of Tantra and versions of Tara, are particularly powerful for dispelling obstacles both inner and outer. So logistically, this is usually practiced on the new moon day of the month. And as I mentioned before, anyone can do the practice, but you don't do the self-generation if you don't have the empowerment. So this Chittamani Tara and 21 Taras practice that we do was brought to Tibet by Lama Atisha, right, of Lamp on the Path fame, somewhere between uh, 982 and 1054. The first Dalai Lama, Gendon Drup, wrote the commonly used sadhanas for Tara. And this version of the praises we use is a translation by Panlo Chempo. So here's where we have the numbers, right? So if this is an image that you're comfortable with and you want to start really visualizing because the prayers are familiar, you start here with this red one. And it just goes one, two, three, four, and then up, five, six, seven, eight, and then over, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then down, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then over 18, 19, 20, 21. Okay, so it's, it's going around in a curve. So if you kind of kind of get used to one image, it doesn't have to be this one, but it can help you direct your visualization. And this is all taken from that book I mentioned yesterday, um, How to Free Your Mind by Venerable Tupjin Children. It's just a really solid text, so I really recommend it. So one of her students put this together. And the depictions of Tara and what they hold, there's going to be variation from different traditions. There are many correct ways. So Tara Swift Heroic, the first one, she's red in color. Her specific function is to control. And there's a ceremony in which a practitioner invokes this Tara to turn back the power of others who are trying to exert harmful power over us. We can reverse that power or turn it away by requesting this Tara's help. So this magnetizing aspect or controlling aspect, um, it's kind of throwing off the imposed control others try and put on us. Then we have number two, um, Tara, like uh, white as the autumn moon, like a hundred luminous autumn moons, she is radiant white, indicating that she liberates sentient beings by peaceful methods 
and can purify all the mental afflictions that keep them bound in cyclic existence. Golden Tara, um, and there's a giant Golden Tara being built in the Blue Mountains of Australia someday. That's gonna be really amazing to see. She is a giver of supreme virtue and is gold with a bluish tint. And her speciality is prolonging life and increasing resources, wisdom, and merit. Four is Tara, the victorious Ushnisha of Tatagatas, and she has a crown protuberance or a Ushnisha on the top of her head. Its cause is a Bodhisattva's great accumulation of merit on the path to Buddhahood. She is golden color, and her speciality is to neutralize poison, increase life, and counteract premature death. She can stop accidents and untimely death, anything that can cause us to die before our full lifespan, as conditioned by our previous karma has been lived out. And then another yellow one is Tara proclaiming the sound of whom, or Tara summoning the three worlds. And she's golden color and just slightly wrathful. Her speciality is influencing and subjugating. And this verse praises her ability to suppress adverse factors. Uh, number six is Tara victorious over the three worlds and she's ruby red although some cases she's reddish black, and her speciality is to purify obscurations and negativities. And here we praise her because worldly gods offer their respect and service to her. So worldly gods um, have not yet achieved enlightenment, but have a huge amount of merit. And these worldly gods with a huge amount of merit, we hope that they're developing on the path to enlightenment with Bodhicitta, but, you know, it's, it's a mix. You can think of them a little bit like the Greek gods. And she has the merit and the karmic connection to influence them, who also have an influence on this world to some degree. And then here's one of the scary looking ones, um, one of the wrathful ones. And Tara crushing adversaries or crushing disputants. Remember, she's intimidating negative states of mind. She's not harming anyone she's actually helping them to not keep creating negative karma. So she's standing amidst a raging fire. Tara crushing adversaries is black and fierce. Her speciality is Poa, the transference of consciousness to Akanisha Pure Land at the time of death. So she very much helps people in the dying process and immediately after. And then Tara who crushes all Maras and bestows supreme powers. Starting with this eighth Tara, we praise the fierce Sambhogakaya aspect, um, the resource body of Buddha aspects. She's golden in color or reddish in color. It depends on the um, tonka painter. And she sits on a crocodile. She's fierce and her speciality is the completion stage practice of highest yoga tantra. So it's an inner manipulation of the um, subtle energy system within the body. And then Tara, grantor of boons, is ruby red. And this verse praises her hand gestures. Her left hand is in the mudra or gesture of the three jewels. The thumb and ring finger touching symbolizes unifying method and wisdom on the path. The three upward fingers represent Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the three refuges. Her speciality is consecration. And then Tara, dispelling all sorrow, is red. And her speciality is destroying Maras. Remembering Maras are like um, negative influences, controlling the world of sentient things and fulfilling all wholesome wishes. Tara will help us fulfill our virtuous aspirations by instructing us on how to create the causes for happiness, liberation, and full enlightenment. Her ritual is for entering the mandala. Tara, dispeller of all misfortune, is the color of darkness. Her speciality is to increase enjoyments and wealth and to eliminate poverty. Here, Tara is praised because she can activate the 10 directional protectors who are inclined towards virtue and are leaders of other spirits. And then Tara of auspicious light is gold or white or goldish white. And we praise her crown ornaments. From her crescent moon crown ornament, 
white light radiates and eliminates sickness, suffering, sorrow, poverty, and depression. Following this, yellow light radiates from her crown ornament and performs the actions of increasing, enhancing sentient beings' lifespan, merit, wisdom, and good qualities. Tara the Ripener, bestower of maturity, is ruby red and standing, and her speciality is to subdue hindrances and to protect from fear and danger. She is completely confident and free from all anxiety and fear. The verse praises her fierce posture of standing in a blazing wreath of fire. Tara, the wrathful summoner, is stamping her foot saying, enough with the obstacles to liberation and enlightenment, enough with the suffering of sentient beings. I'm going to destroy these. Her body is made of black light and she stands amidst a protective blaze of wisdom. Forming a protective circle of light, she destroys interferences to the flourishing of the Dharma and interferences to the happiness and well being of sentient beings. Tara, the great peaceful one, is white in color. And there's an external cleansing or purifying ritual that goes with her practice. And her speciality is to pacify destructive karma that causes suffering and prevents realizations of the path to enlightenment. The verse praises her speech and her dharmakaya or truth body mind. All her actions are done with the peace of nirvana. Tara, destroyer of all attachment, number 16. She's coral red. She amplifies the power of mantras, cuts harmful thoughts that impede the increase of positive energy. This verse praises the activity of both her peaceful and fierce mantras. When she teaches the Dharma through the action of her speech, all afflictions are pacified. This doesn't mean that Tara teaches and afflictions magically vanish. Rather, from our side, we see sentient beings respond to the teachings and put them into practice. While Tara can guide and instruct us, we need to make effort to cease our afflictions and develop our good qualities. And Tara, the accomplisher of all bliss, She's orange or reddish, and her speciality is to bind thieves and eliminate the power of black magic mantras. This, praise, this verse praises her fierce activity of shaking the three worlds, below, on, and above the earth. From the primordial sound whom appears Ture, which means Tara, and her pounding feet make everything in the external worlds tremble. This indicates her power, the power of a Buddha's enlightening activity. 18 is Tara the Victorious, who is white, and her speciality is to dispel diseases caused by Nagas, such as leprosy, tumors, and boils. She also pacifies diseases caused by poisons like toxins in the environment, air pollution, and food poisoning. This first praises her activities that dispel the poisons of the world and the environment. Tara, consumer of all suffering, or Tara, invincible queen. She is white, and her speciality is to free from poison. This verse praises her activity of dispelling conflict, bad thoughts, and nightmares. Relying on this Tara when we are depressed or if we have suicidal thoughts is very effective in overcoming such disturbing emotions and thoughts. Tara's source of all attainments is orange and grants the power to make oneself invisible. This verse praises her ability to dispel fevers and epidemic diseases. Just as some illnesses drag on, so too cyclic existence drags on and flares up. She frees us from both. Uttering Hara twice means reciting the fierce mantra, Om Nama Tare Nama Hare Hum Hare Soha, and uttering Tutara, means reciting the peaceful mantra, Om Tari Tutari Tari Soha, the one we're used to. When we're ill, relying on the fierce and the peaceful aspects of Tara and reciting their mantras are helpful. This meditation is good for illness such as cancer, AIDS, new diseases, environmental pollution, and illnesses that are difficult to cure. So perfect, uh, very relevant right now with the pandemic. And then the last one, Tara the Perfector, 
Tara the Perfector is white and her speciality is taking practitioners to Akanish the Pure Land in this very life. This verse praises her activity of subduing evil spirits and zombies. Her three natures are her body, speech, and mind, appearing as an om at her crown chakra, odd or throat chakra, and whom at her heart chakra. These pacify internal poisons, such as afflictions and external interferences, such as non-human beings and spirits who take away the power of medicine, the power of our body, or the power of food. This Tara is very effective in dispelling mental illness due to spirit interference. So that's um, the qualities of the 21. And um, there's also meditations which eat the of the 21. Basically, you're gonna see the slight variation in what they're holding so sometimes they're holding a very obvious implement related to the qualities they embody, but some artists will depict them all universally holding a wealth vase. So um, there are many correct ways. There was sometimes slight variation in the colors due to traditions, but the qualities they embody and invoke and purify are pretty universal across the different commentaries and traditions. So, um, you know, it's something interesting to read up on and, and have a think about. Um, I think Tara can be particularly soothing for children as well. Um, you know, when I am in the rare position of babysitting, um, you know, I try out all the different mantras on the crying baby. Tara seems to work really well. <laughs> right. um, or telling them stories about Tara seems to work really well. Um, yeah, but I think it also helps us to remember this effect of d really helping with pandemic things and with poison things and things that we notice in this degenerate age, like our food lacking some vitality and not having quite the oomph that it used to, stuff like that. So, so Tara practice can really um, brighten up and activate and help a lot of our vitality issues. If we're just feeling a bit kind of ugh and sluggish, it can clear a lot of those kind of obstacles related to the environment. I've been doing a prayer to Lama Tsongkhapa and in it, it um, talks about um, deity. So I'm kind of confused because, you know, deities aren't, I don't understand deities in the context of Buddha, of Buddhism. Generally speaking, we say deities and Buddhas synonymously. Occasionally we're referring to deities of the God realms or form and formless realm absorptions or other contexts, but it's usually clear. So um, deities, you know, and deity yoga and one with the deity, whenever you're hearing that framing, it's synonymous with Buddha. It's just, it can be a little confusing, but yeah, they're synonyms for the most part, unless it's kind of a small D deity referring to suras and asuras and, you know. But it's a different meaning from a Judeo-Christian context. Well, it's different in the sense of, we believe that enlightened beings are all knowing but not necessarily all powerful or creators of the world, right? So what created the universe, not God, not the deities, but our communal karma created this world. Consciousness is beginningless, time is beginningless. And some consciousnesses have purified and developed into a perfected state called Buddhahood, a deityhood. Right. And so they're omniscient in the sense of being able to see the minds of sentient beings, see the spectrum of their karma, see what conditions are going to be conducive for them developing on their path and how they can manifest in such a way that is the best for us. Because they were all just like us at one point. They just worked and developed their minds and they want us to be able to do the same. Yeah. So right. deity in the sense of Buddha like that not creators, but still omniscient. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, Catherine, go ahead. When, we, when you very kindly guided us through that practice, uh, um, there's parts of it that I think I, you know, I, uh, um, I can understand more easily than, uh, than other parts. I'll, I'll say it like that. That's probably the easiest way. And there's other parts that I, I don't necessarily understand and I just kind of put over there or, or whatever. So the actual question becomes, because I have 
such a tightsy-wightsy little very beginning understanding, if even at all, of emptiness. Um, but the, it's intellectual. And because, um, because I have been so blessed uh, being in, able to take a class like this or classes from um, so many people um, that I just, it's, and the, the kind of information is just uh, tremendous that enriches um, the, the world daily or, or my own world anyways. And I think the world in general um, so there's that part, and then there's the emptiness part. So what's happening in my mind, and I need, I don't, I don't want to continue down that path. Is well, if everything is em ultimately empty, what is empty anyways? You know, the dependent arising or this or that. What does it look like? I don't know. Um, but then, why are we studying all of this? Well, because it's important, and I can find myself drifting off, and then keep having to pull myself back. Mm -hmm. and trying to understand something that I, I sense I'm not supposed to understand, that it could almost be an obstacle. And I, I so would appreciate if this makes sense, and if it does, if, if that's... It's, it sounds like a really natural and common stuck spot of not understanding relative truth and ultimate truth. So the ultimate truth of everything is that it lacks inherence. It's empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. Now that means it arises, it's there, it's in front of you. And at our level, all we see is a projection kind of from our ignorance. So we don't see the ultimate truth of things, we only see the relative truth of things and the relative truth is by nature deceptive. So what we're trying to do is work within the deception to make it clearer and cleaner and more healthy and more beneficial to ourselves and others while not getting locked into too much literalness or fundamentalism or tightness with our mode of practice. So you're trying to maintain your best ethics, your best heart, while at the same time not becoming uptight. And this balancing act, it does require a great deal of study and thought to understand the way in which things really are. But practically speaking, part of you already understands the way to practice. I think all of us do, but we haven't articulated it. It's something as simple as take an act that is a kindness, right? Like giving food to poor people, okay? giving food to poor people. We're all like, that's a good idea, right? Who's with me? Good idea, give food to poor people, right? And so if you're giving food to poor people, that's in the realm of relative truth, altruism. And if you remember emptiness, then you remember that your ability to give is a dependent arising. Their ability to receive is a dependent arising. Them being happy about it, you being happy about it is a dependent arising. It being helpful or not, is a dependent arising. So as a concept, you know, giving food to the hungry is a wonderful thing, but in the one-on-one -on -one dynamic, for some people, it encourages complacency and laziness and entitlement. For some people, it relieves their suffering, helps them get their feet under them, and they can progress and kind of start to have some momentum. So in and of itself, it's not good, but as a concept, it is. Right. And so you're holding that wisdom that you have as just a woman of the world who has seen life. Right. And you're trying to operate within that space that is then still able to do things like giving, but not be attached to assuming it's always good in every instance, divorced from context. Right. So, so we just weave back and forth, trying to do the best we can with the appearances we have, while at the same time confronting appearances very much yeah so slowly slowly but we just keep working on it good well thanks everybody and um, we'll go ahead and dedicate may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more may the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more and then some long life prayers.
the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Thanks, folks. See you next time. Thanks very much, Urza and Mary Ellen and Colleen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very you. much.